We had a major discussion and we're still discussing these ideas of the two different methodologies when it comes to learning, the ecological dynamics approach or the cognitive load theory approach. Basically, ecological dynamics takes into account task, environment and constraints and, and this stems from a lot of what Marcus Di Bernardo teaches um, who was a coach that we really respect and we're just having this conversation with him he can't tell Messi what to do because he doesn't know his capabilities so setting up a training environment that either allows a constraint or manipulating the task or manipulating the environment to get what you want out of it is huge and on the other side is, is the cognitive load theory which Doug Lamov, who is an educator um, and someone who we really respect as well, this is more on short-term memory and long-term memory. So what that approach is, can we encode these skill sets, passing, receiving, shooting, into the long-term memory, which will free up working memory to perceive, decide. What we love about our job is we get to experiment with that every single day. And as long as you're given everything in a session, the parents and the players, they can see that too. If we're talking about development, you're preaching development, but you're not looking for it yourself, then that's a problem. What's happening guys? We're here at the United Soccer Convention uh, with Bistera Soccer Training. We got Matt and James. Uh, super happy to have you guys on, man. We just kind of caught you randomly walking yeah. by, followed you on Instagram for a while. You guys have done an amazing job with your brand and, and, and being consistent with your content. And it really aligns with ours. And, 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 and so I was like, we got to have these guys on, just talk about what you guys are doing and, and just kind of, uh, you know, show everyone the importance of supplemental training and, and, um, and you know, give you guys a chance to promote your brand and uh, and you know cross promote each other a little bit so thanks you guys for coming on I know we had a little bit of a delay but we're here now and we're ready to go so we're rolling we're rolling if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself kind of giving a brief background to everyone like where you guys came from how you got into Bistera and and uh, you know where you're at now well thanks very much for having us on um, my name's James Beeston um, grew up in England for the first 19 years of my life, played over there at Port Vale Academy, um, who are a professional club. Not many people know them because it's uh, a, one of the only teams that's not named after a place in England. Ah. So that's located in Stoke. So I grew up playing in their academy from the ages of 6 to 19. Didn't get offered a professional contract, so... I took an opportunity to, to study over here. I went to Siena College um, in Albany, New York. And then, yeah, we started Bistera. And Matt, if you want to say your bit. Yeah, so my name's Matt Needham. Uh, very similar story to James. Um, I grew up playing in England also for a team called Chesterfield. I uh, did a two-year youth contract. I uh, had a short stint as a pro before coming over to the States, um, joining James at Siena. And then from there, uh, we started a company called Bistera Soccer Training. So you guys have been in Bistera together from the beginning? Or how, how did no, it start? So, so it actually started, it, it was originally called Beast and Soccer Training, so I initially started it. <laughs> but um, with visas, a visa situation, you're not allowed, you, I only had one year post-graduation to you know, start a company, but I couldn't really sponsor myself. Uh. Um, so the other owner, Mike Matera, expressed an interest in getting on board, so we just combined our last names, so that's why Bistera came about. Oh, okay. Um, and then Matt came on board two years later. Um, so it's the three of us that own, that own the business now. All right. So that then allowed you to sponsor yourself? Not initially. So Mike took care of the whole of business then. I went back to school down in Alabama. So it was a brief stint down there for about three years um, to get my graduate degree. Returned to Albany and then fortunately the company was able to sponsor my my visa now so oh okay yes yeah very good it i know that all worked out process, in the end man. it was a difficult process absolutely but because i it all worked out well I, I had a partner a good friend of mine roommate in college from london and he worked with us in footy factory or me at the time evan wasn't involved yet but uh man i, I just wasn't in a position to like be able to support him that way and 
had to send him back home. Not send him back home. But <laughs> had to get rid of the dead weight. He, he had to go back home because his visa was expiring, and I felt terrible about it, man. I love the guy, and, man, I wish we could bring him back right now, you know. Yeah. Um, so I know I know how much of a process yeah. that is. He, Matt had a little bit of a different journey with, with your visa, didn't you? Yeah, so I uh, – obviously, as you know, it's, it's tough, especially being from – the UK mm -hmm. or any like to actually get over here yeah actually stay in especially when you build a life um, like we, we, we came over here to play in college and they were formative years between the age of 18 and 23 yeah um, it's then pretty much after you've done your your one year one year that you're allowed after college to work they say okay see you later like so you either go home or find a way I actually worked in finance for a long time oh, yeah. which is a bit different to what I do now yeah um, <laughs> I bet you enjoy this a lot uh, it's a little bit better yeah. like, I, I'm, not, I'm not one for sitting behind a desk to be honest but I actually got sponsored <laughs> that way nice oh, okay. nice yeah. good yeah I mean you gotta you gotta figure out a way to get it done however it is so I know and then what's the other way just getting married right that's yeah, one pretty I saw much. your rings that's what I thought <laughs> yeah, you were going yeah, for yeah, I was like yeah. I just had to get married quick <laughs> well <laughs> this wasn't this, this, not how I got the green I got card you, yeah. I got you. <laughs> we definitely explored that path with Carl uh, <laughs> <laughs> tried to get him hitched before he well, y'all probably could have legally married, right? Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are we I'm talking just saying, about here, to keep man? the guy over here, you know? All right, man. This is a player <laughs> development podcast. Okay? Uh, anyway, so I look back at, like, my time in college, right? And um, a, a main motivation for me in starting, like, a training business was the fact that I felt like I there was a big hole in my own development as a player in the education that I was getting on a, on a technical and a tactical, tactical level as a youth and then going to college as an 18 year old, maybe 17 going on, no, I was 18 already. Uh, and, and, and you have international players coming in that have already been like in like a professional academy or even have professional experience, right? English players, uh, I had, there were some players from Denmark that were like 26 years old as seniors. Yeah. And so it was like, you were stepping into a whole new world yeah. and just from observing them, I, I realized like that their background and, and the education that they had received was just on a whole different level. Did you guys feel that way coming over playing college? Like maybe you were a little bit of, ahead of your American teammates? Um, initially when I was first committed to Siena, arrogantly, I would think um, no way have these American players spent as much time on the ball as I have. Right. From an arrogant standpoint. Yeah. When I turned up on the first day and we had a little pickup game, I was pleasantly surprised by the American lads. Yeah. I really was. And we had, we had a good mixture of um, Americans, Europeans within the team that were all a blue-collar work ethic. So everyone worked for each other, but the level of technical ability was, was surprising for me. And I think that the technical level is getting a lot better oh, yeah, yeah. in the U.S. as a whole. But then it's the application of the technical to the tactical where there's a big gap, right? Yeah, I'd say when first coming over, I'd say even technically a lot of the American players were as good, if not better. I'd say 90% of them were probably better. Um, I'd say knowledge of the game mm -hmm. and knowledge of what happens in game and being able to make quick decisions. I'd say the international players did exceed. Definitely a step ahead for sure on that. that. And I think a lot of it has to do with one culture because we're that you play you play soccer. If you you're from the UK, you play soccer in some form. Yeah, of you, you live, eat, breathe it. Yeah, and there's also shared vocab. Mm -hmm. Like I feel as though here every different coach is like they'll be talking about the same things but they'll use different vocab so you're not really sure yeah or there's it, confusion in the uk there's a shared vocab and that definitely helps so when we're talking we'll know what each other's talking about immediately because we've used that same language all growing up here you can go even between towns or even between clubs and there's different coaches will say different things and is that is that something that you feel like you guys have implemented in terms of like the unified language within your training at bistera it's funny you say that. We were actually speaking about this earlier. So um, we need to do a better job of a vocab list that every coach on staff knows what's what. Mm -hmm. Because we could we could say one thing, you know, as we operate on a carousel model, they could be with me 30 minutes later and go with Matt. Matt could say, receive on the back foot. 
I could say receive on the front foot meaning the exact same thing. So I think it's just applying a universal vocab list amongst all of our coaches, which we're, we're going to work on, but also just prompting the players to say, you know, just because we say back foot, your club coach may say front foot. So it can be both, if that makes sense. So you have to almost like take that into consideration yes. that it is going to be different in yes. different environments. And I also think, uh, to, to, to mention your point about the education piece back home, I received a lot of education by actually going to watch professional games. So my local team, Port Vale, the professional team, I get cheap tickets because I play for their academy. So I'd go and watch professional like every soccer game, yeah. every, every other week when they played at home. So there's things that you can see when you're not watching TV, right? You're not watching it on TV, you're watching the live games. You can actually study a player's movements off the ball, on the ball. Um, certain patterns that are, that are developing amongst the team, patterns of play, what the players typically do when they're receiving it, are there certain tendencies. For the players that we train in Albany, the closest professional team is three hours away. So they're not getting that level of watching education. I think, you know, the, the impact that, you know, the Premier League and, and every other league in the top professional divisions is having nowadays and the exposure that it's getting in America is, is massively improved but there's nothing quite like that live watching watching professional games live yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so a couple of things first why is technical training so critical in, in this country versus like the way that players are developed in South America or even in Europe where it's like a more structured like academy environment South America maybe it's like you know, playing in the street, the freestyle, right? Um, we've had this conversation with a few other people, and, mm -hmm. and I'm just interested to get y'all's perspective. Why, why is it so important here? Because I think it is critical, even though it's not really done in other countries as much. The pay-to-play model yeah. um, has a big, big part yeah. to play in it. And I think with the pay-to-play model, we're not for it. But if we weren't for like, if it wasn't, for the pay-to-play model, we wouldn't be here right now. Right. Exactly. So we can't we can't be you know hypocritical about it. I do think, um, in terms of when we were younger, we'd go go down the local park and just play pickup. You'd play unorganized pickup and just figure it out yourselves. Here, it's a lot more structured. There's multiple sports going on. It seems as though kids are being carted off to soccer practice. Oh, and then we've got basketball practice very rarely do I see you know driving around Albany is kids just going out to the local playing. park and just playing yeah you rarely see it so the in terms of the technical development we're making a big push to actually break down with a lot of detail the certain technical elements and what the players can do in their own time to maximise their, their technical development right yeah I also think that during your team practice, you've got a limited amount of time for what you can work on. I think that in a team practice, or because of that limited amount of time, you want to be focused on the game, mostly. However, what we learned, and we were both club coaches originally before we started this, is that you might introduce a concept. Two kids are going to get it straight away. Ten kids is going to take 20 minutes. And ten kids might take five weeks. You know what I mean? So being able to have that individual one-on-one -on -one and actually diagnosing okay why is it that this skill you can't perform this skill right now why is it because it's different for everybody a club coach doesn't have the time to do that for every single kid I think technical especially with the way the game's going right now I think that individual piece now is going to become more important than ever yeah. because that's how we're developing athletes now and everybody needs something different whether yeah. it be technical or even just some, or a mentor or even just someone to talk to yeah. um, and I think to, to really get dive deep into what you as a player need that technical piece that one-on-one -on -one piece now is critical oh yeah, yeah for sure absolutely I yeah. think it's becoming just part of our system you know and the way that we develop our players um, I know for us like whenever we first started Footy Factory we were pretty much the only you know, individual training company in our area, and now they're everywhere, you yeah, know, and I'm sure for you guys it was very similar. Um, 
why has it become so popular? Like, is it just, I mean, it, 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 it's just people saw the opportunity in it from a business perspective? I think a lot of it is to do with that. I also think the influx of social media has uh, has only accelerated the supplemental training space. Yeah. If there wasn't Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, it would be interesting to see how many more supple trainers would be out there if yeah, there wasn't yeah. social media. Exactly. Yeah. Right, 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 right. So I think just because it's more accessible. And I also think a lot of players think supplemental trainers just throw down cones and expect. Yeah. That's it. Like. Yeah, yeah. No, there's there's thought behind everything here. There has like, to be with what we're doing, what we're trying to achieve out of this. So. I'm glad you you said that because that's actually like leading to the second part of my question is the reason why I think that I've like really taken a liking to your brand and what you guys are doing is because it's in terms of the training methodology, it, it aligns with what we're doing in that the training has to be game realistic, right? In terms of the movements that you're actually making, it's not just programmed ball mastery. There's ball mastery incorporated incorporated into everything that you're doing, but it's not just like online, stationary, not moving, not, there's yeah. no, it's not where there's no application to the game. But leading, leading building on that, it's like now we're starting to see more and there's a lot of trainers that still just do that, right? But now we're starting to see more that are incorporating because they see the content that you put out or whoever and, and they copy the exercises and the training looks game-like, but are they actually painting the picture for the player to where they understand how it applies to a game? Like for us, it's, it's the exercise is one thing, but actually like showing them the why is, is the learning, is mm -hmm. the teaching, you know? Yeah. And I think that you guys do a great job of that. And um, like, I think that, that without that, like, it doesn't matter what the exercise is, it's not gonna necessarily benefit the player in the same way. Yeah, and we, we had a major um, discussion and we're still, we're still discussing these ideas of, of the two different methodologies when it comes to learning. So the ecological dynamics approach or the cognitive load theory approach. So basically, ecological dynamics takes into account task, environment, and constraints. So for me to say, Evan, you have to receive the ball like this in this situation may be limiting you because I don't know what you're capable of. And, and this stems from a lot of what Marcus DiBernardo teaches, um, who was a coach that we really respect. And we're just having this conversation with him. He can't tell Messi what to do because he doesn't know his capabilities. So setting up a training environment that either allows a constraint or manipulating the task or manipulating the environment to get what you want out of it is huge. And on the other side is, is the cognitive load theory, which Doug Lamoff, who is an educator um, and someone who we really respect as well, this is more on short-term memory and long-term memory. So whether something you have learned say if you're in the car and you're listening to a, ra a song comes on the radio what you haven't heard in five years but you still know every word that's because it's been encoded in your long-term memory mm. what that approach is can we encode these skill sets passing receiving shooting into the long-term memory which will free up work in memory to perceive decide so we're still trying to figure that out too because we can see both sides so what we love about our job is we get to experiment with that every single day and as long as you're giving everything in a session the parents and the players they can see that too mm -hmm. they can you know we we as end a the trainer sessions. You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah we end the sessions yeah. with like we always talk about player development but coaching development you know you say to a player did you like it? What didn't you like about that? You're not going to hurt my feelings if you, if you say, I thought this was a bit too long or I didn't really get what we were trying to do there because it has to be an engagement. If we're talking about development, you're preaching development, but you're not looking for it yourself, then that's a problem. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Bit of a long-winded answer, I'm sorry. But no, I love it. Yeah, I mean, it's I love a good it. answer for sure. Do you have anything you wanted to add on to that? Yeah, I think that... Um, the technical piece is I, th I think you see a lot of trainers still just drilling out and, th and th I think there is a time and a place for that um, we'd never want to 
be that kind of trainer. It's like I think there's a difference between a trainer and a coach, and I think you can be both in the same session. Yeah, sure. Like, for sure. I think sometimes, yeah, okay, this player has it. Let's go. Yeah, let's do this. All right, but explaining the why behind everything, like well, I think we, over COVID, we we discussed all this stuff and we continue to do so, like James said. But explaining, you have to explain the why. Yeah. Yeah. Now that doesn't have to be a full in-depth answer. I, I don't think James is gonna go and say what he's just said to a seven-year-old. Right. Like, right. You know right. I right. mean, however, yeah. explain the why. Like, why do we do this? Like, because it because it is in, again in England we talked about that education piece that was what it was we remember it now because we remember the why why is it happened we don't remember it's not it's not just memorized it's mm -hmm. we remember the why behind it okay so it, actually encoding that in your players yeah one it, it shows them that you've got respect for them okay i'm going to explain the why i'm going to treat you like an adult two that's how you remember stuff right? yeah so always always backing it up with the why i think is so important yeah absolutely it, it it's obviously important on the on for for learning i think it also helps with the motivation levels too you know like if if a player you know they're asked to do something they're like ah they're probably going to go through it go through the motions you know because it's what coach told you to do uh but if all of a sudden they are able to take exactly the same movements that they're making and picture how it would present itself in a game then all of a sudden they're like okay you know it, it their energy, their intensity just goes up from there. Yeah, I think that we always say to our players, uh, the question, why are we doing this, is not a rude question. Yeah. If I cannot come up with an answer to that, I should not be doing what I'm doing. And I think that's any coach, but you see a, a lot of coaches, they, they, they go off of the, okay, why are we doing this, coach? That's rude. You can't ask that. Right. Like, no, 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 okay, this is why we're doing it. Yeah. I think that shows respect to the player, and I think that, that piece is so important. <laughs> absolutely absolutely Evan what do you think well because I mean at the end of the day I mean I think most of the time when we get players in it's because they're trying to trying to reach a goal for themselves or a lot of the times whenever a parent brings you a player it's always oh they need to catch up oh there's this oh there's this missing from their game so I just think the most important thing technical wise is just just giving them confidence you know like because obviously they're coming because they're yeah. struggling at something so if you kind of focus on that and like you said you give them the why so then when they're actually in the game they can kind of already picture it I think that's just the most important thing it's just trying to trying to fill holes that you might have because everything else could be there but if you're struggling at one thing like you said you're not going to get it at a team session so you can come to this training hey maybe you only need to go to a couple trainings you're caught up you're good but more often than not it usually works out you come to those trainings you get caught up and then now we can just work on kind of getting everything else together yeah, as a Yeah, that's whole. like the glue is what yeah, connects yeah. all the dots, you know. Mm -hmm. Exactly, so yeah. what yeah. you said about goals there, Evan. Yeah. Not everyone wants to be a professional footballer. Yeah. And when we first started, we are like, we're going to make everyone a pro. But when you speak to people, like, I remember speaking to a girl once and I'm like, what do you want out of the game? Yeah. She goes, I just want to make friends. I just want to be better to make friends on my team right now because I found a new team and I just want to be a little bit better to make friends. So our feedback in the session, it's not as though she wants to be a professional. Yeah. If, if someone comes to us and say, I want to play pro, and you say, well, how often do you train? And they say three times a week. You say, you never, it's never going to Yeah, happen. it's not enough. It's just never going to happen. So understanding everyone's motivation is different, and everyone's mm -hmm. goals are different, yeah. that allows us to tier our feedback to them and what what our expectancy is of them absolutely yeah. so you you guys really you'll train all levels it doesn't matter who you are where you're at like you'll meet them where they're at yeah absolutely i think uh, like james said that setting the goals like what what do you want out of this i think we went out with the mission i think as, to start with we actually we actually set up all independently uh, us three before coming together but to start with the goal was always I'm going to turn everyone into a college soccer player I'm going to turn everyone into a pro the more you go the more you realize that that isn't realistic so you need to redefine what it is that you're working for I mean for us it's always uh, we say it all the time it's always great players better people and that's what we want to do we just want to develop the human being in some kind of way if that obviously we want to improve them in soccer but if, if we can improve if we can teach something else if we can teach life skills through soccer then hey, that's a win as well. You know, Absolutely. I mean, like, <laughs> how how long are you into uh, your business now? How many years has it been? We are in our eighth eighth, eighth year. 
Okay, so we, we're on kind of the same timeline. We've gone through a bunch of different shifts, but it seems like you guys have just been moving straight down the path. Do you, see, do you think that you are where you expected to be at this time? You know, a little bit further along, maybe not quite where you wanted to be, or? I don't think we ever expected to be here. I, I, this, uh, for me, it started, this will be a nice part-time thing. And yeah. now there's, we have us three who are full-time, another full-time employee. We've also got several part-time employees. Um, to be able to do this full-time is a lot further than I thought we'd ever go. But at the same time, it's, it's not where we want to stop. It's like you've carved out a whole new role for yourself that didn't exist. And now it's taking you places all over the world. Like I know you guys have collaborated with other brands and, and things like this, coming to these kinds of you know conventions and events. Like I didn't expect to be here. You uh, know? Me, neither. me neither. It's nuts as well. Yeah. I mean, obviously, like you starting the podcast and stuff like that. Would you have thought that when you first started Footy Factory? You know, all, all really 15 think. of our yeah. listeners. Hey, man, you know. No, nah, I'm kidding. They're hitting, they're hitting people. They're hitting people. I mean, it's, it's, it's cool. I mean, I think that I like it, obviously, because I'm not – I wasn't fully into coaching teams personally, but I know there are coaches that do it. And so instead of me being like, okay, well, I can't coach teams anymore, then I'm just, like, done with soccer. All I can do is watch now. It's like, no, nah, you can – you know, I still have uh, – some talent I still have something I think I can give to other players and whatnot and so this is just like an avenue that I can do it at so yeah it's so mm. exciting that it's it's no one's wrote the handbook on this oh yeah. no yeah no. so what's so exciting is you can go in whatever direction that you want yeah like, absolutely we've just started a futsal program people say about podcasts and not we're not at that stage yet we don't want to do a podcast yet because you have you only got so much time and you're like okay how do we want to maximize our time here yeah um maybe one day but we're not there yet so again it's just waking up if, if someone has a good idea i mean we always tell our staff if you have something that you want to do and you're passionate about it tell us and yeah. we'll see if we can make it happen because you're gonna if you're intrinsically motivated to do something the the product whatever you're putting out there will will show and it'll be it'll be quality because you've invested that time. You're intrinsically motivated to want to put something out there. Mm -hmm. 100. Yeah. Awesome. yeah, yeah. For me, my motivation is making an impact, helping players be the best that they can be, and that's obviously what this podcast is for too. I think obviously, you know, I also coach uh, ECNL team U17 level, so it's you know a high level. It's 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 competitive, and like my passion, I think, is coaching teams because of the com competition aspect of it. And maybe that's a little bit of the player in me, like, coming out. But I also, like, feel so rewarded in an individual session, too. I get so much out of both, but they're both very different. And so my question to you is, do you enjoy the individual training, or do you see yourself eventually maybe coaching teams? No. Not at all? <laughs> no, I don't. And um, I love coaching. And I love that individual or small group connection. Yeah. And I feel as though I can keep my finger on the pulse of the session yes. um, in an individual or small, ba small group uh, session. But going to teams, I don't rate myself um, in terms of like, tactically when to make substitutions what's the game need now a lot of coaches thrive on that me personally i think my i'm at my best when i'm teaching yeah. in a small group session um or an individual session so not for me i think you may be a little bit different right i mean i started that way i think i think i started i'd always do teams and i've i've gotten to i i really enjoy the individuals now for that exact reason that one-on-one -on -one connection but I mean, it, even different coaches on our staff have different goals. I mean, Curtis, who's uh, one of our full-time uh, coaches, he is a master at team training. He's, a, he's, he's awesome at it, and that's what he wants to do. He also coaches uh, is it UPSL, the New York Shockers, as okay. well, to get that big team, yeah. team aspect, and he, he is brilliant at it. He, he loves all that stuff. He loves diving deep into the team and the team dynamics and how do you make this happen, not just the soccer part, but... I think f for me, I, I really do enjoy that one-on-one. -on -one. How can I develop this person? Yeah. And I enjoy that that kind of like where you 
figuring out, you're building a relationship, and I think I think that was really amplified in a one-on-one -on -one session. Yeah, you can obviously have a much deeper impact on a player on an individual basis, and for that reason, I really enjoy the individual training. But you can control more of the development process in a team setting, right? So and so that's why I'm a little bit torn. I, I just I enjoy both and like. I'm going to push my coaching career, you know, because that, that will always, uh, Footy Factory will always be a supplement to that, I think. And, but I, I don't think I can ever just not do individual training because every time I go into an individual session, it's like you, you're able to just like take a deep breath and like just relax and be there for the player, present for the player, you know, and, and give them what they need and not have to worry about are you meeting the demands and the needs of other players yeah. too, you know? I think it's important to remember as well that the, the individuals and small groups are supplemental training. They supplement team training. They don't re replace it. Yeah. Like, and we, we are very understanding of that. Like, team training comes first. It does. We, we are here to assist. Like, we are here to help. And even in, in our own program, um, sup like, individual and one-on-one -on -one sessions are just a small part of what we do. We also do go and do team sessions with other clubs not our, we don't have our own club but we go and take team sessions with our other club with our club we like I said James said we started a futsal program um, it, all with the view it is supplemental um, I think it, it, like, as, a, as an individual trainer that's really really important to remember yeah absolutely where do you guys see yourself in the next five years the company individually um, we have lofty goals we have lofty goals. Um, personally, I'd love to present here at the convention. I could see you center. doing that. Um, I really think it would be um, really good for for the supplemental trainers just to, because I, I feel as though we often get given a bad rep of, you know, throwing cones down, as I said previously, but, you know, just to show the level of detail that can come from a supplemental training session. So that's personally for me. Yeah, I think just keep spreading the good word I, uh, I think expanding out of Albany um, would be good like start start getting just just so we can just so we can affect more people I think yeah. it's always if the goal is development yeah, that's great Albany only has a certain amount of soccer players um, yeah. same I, I think just, just keep pushing like we never like I said previously we never thought we'd be here so let's just see how far it can go it's got to keep going. Do you see Bistera expanding outside of just Albany and New York? I think so. I yeah. think I, I, I would hope so. Again, we don't. If we're going to do that, the quality has to remain. Oh, for yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Has, to, has to remain. Like we do, we're not going to just go and can't sacrifice the it. brand. Correct. Yeah. yeah, and that's what a lot of our brand is based on. Like that high, highest quality, and we've had eight years, like we said, of learning from each other, mm -hmm. and we're still not the finished article. Like it's nice now to be able to pass that on to other coaches, yeah. But as soon as you start expanding, that gets a lot harder. So, just having, getting a way that we can retain that quality, but obviously like expand out and try and affect more players. Yeah, I think like working through the trainers would allows you to have a bigger reach and impact more players as a result. You know, obviously you always want to be in contact with the player but like for us for example like i could see us moving more towards the trainer education and and trying to build our training network and that is kind of what you know we hope our model to be uh in the future so you know i guess with 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 that said like do you guys have um like plans in place to implement trainer education you said you wanted to you know present at events like this like that's train that's education yeah we, we do have plans to do it um i mean switching from live in-person sessions i mean the online space virtual um would be something that we'd be really interested in as well i mean going through the pandemic that opened so many doors in terms of connecting people through zoom or you know online courses so we feel as though we can maintain our quality doing that too. I think putting together a pilot program for the trainers that we have on staff first, 
to make sure you know we, we can again experiment with it and say to them what did you like about that what didn't you like about that and then put a product out there that you know is is representative of the beast era brand for coaching education is, is definitely something that we'd look to do yeah yeah i think that we started getting stuff in place and this began in covid of having our own curriculum like this is who we are mm -hmm. this is what we're doing that like james said earlier it this there's no roadmap to this this has not yeah. really been done before so actually getting a curriculum in place for individual and small group sessions and what you focus on because yeah. it's all very well to say hey here's your technical skills but like what okay if you're striking a ball what do we focus on and if you actually look at how people strike a ball they all do it differently so what is what parameters are you operating from because um, it's to be it, to be honest it's taken us years to be able to look at a kid and go this is the problem like because uh, and then writing down and consolidating that knowledge that that is what we are currently going through and getting training programs in place but it's not not easy no. and another thing that we haven't mentioned is the importance of mental training yeah you mentioned confidence earlier we always say to the players how much of the game is mental guaranteed they will say above 60 percent and then you reply with well how much time do you spend training that and they'll say nothing i, I don't mm -hmm. and for us it's figuring out i actually bookmarked a lot of mental training um seminars here that i want to go and learn more about because if you can tap into someone's confidence levels and, and boost that they're different players they're completely different players so you know how to deal with anxiety how to deal with stress on the field you know you've had a bad day players come to us after taking an SAT test okay well I'm gonna restructure the way that I'm phrasing things now if you're just had to take the SAT test I'm not gonna overload you with information so it's understanding the emotional part of, of people and and how we can best you know serve them yeah that's awesome, man. You have any more questions for them? No, nothing. I think we hit everything on the head. And I'm just glad we met. Yeah, I know. You know? Yeah, it's man. exciting. This was so random. Did not expect to see you guys here, but it was only a matter of time, I think, before we did connect. And um, I know we got delayed a little bit, so you know I don't want to hold you guys too long. But uh, I'm glad we had this talk. We could probably go on for for hours. Yeah, we'll definitely really. have to do it again and and figure out other ways that we can collaborate with each other, whether it be through camps or. Or just more podcasts yeah. and different things like that. So. Yeah, we've never been to Texas. We'd love a yeah. come through. And then have you been to New York? Nope. I've only been go. once, but yeah. Yeah, we can go from yeah. both ways. You guys come to Dallas in the winter. We'll go to New York in the summer. <laughs> hey, that works. So, so we don't have to <laughs> deal with that. That ain't for me, man. Nah, not trying to not trying to deal with that shit, man. Yeah. Nah, no shot. Yeah. No shot. Well, thanks, guys. Great. I appreciate well, your time. Thank you. Appreciate it, James. Yeah.